We are live. JT here. Welcome to The Huddle. The Huddle is where I sit down with successful people from the world of sport and coaching. It's to learn more about their journey to greatness. Why do I have these conversations? Because success always leaves clues. I just want to welcome you today and send you some appreciation, whether you are tuning in with us live in the Facebook community, whether you are watching the replay on YouTube, whether you are listening to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me and my special guest today. And I guarantee you that you're going to grab some nuggets of wisdom. You're going to hear some stuff that will allow you to be great at the game of life. I've been looking forward to my conversation. Uh, again, I've, I've got to meet, although virtually, uh, a few years ago, my guest today. Uh, but you know, the one thing that I definitely, I, I definitely learned a lot from him, watching him at a coaching clinic back in 2013, when he was presenting about safe tackling, safe contact. And you know, I, I still remember, I sent an email out to him right after the clinic, asking him for some guidance, you know, tapping into his expertise. And right away, he, he was like, coach, how can I help? So, so again, I've really, you know, got to really respect him in terms of his willingness to give and, and be a servant-based leader. My guest in the huddle today is the head coach of the Cora Cults in Sault Ste. Marie here in Ontario, Coach Tom Mennett. How are you today, coach? I'm great, JT. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, grateful. Uh, again, you're able to carve out some time, especially here uh, as we get close to near the end of the summer. I know uh, high school footballs, you know, it's getting closer. So I know you got lots in place. So thank you for uh, being able to spend some time with us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. So coach, I just want to take a moment just to acknowledge you. And what I wanted to do was just, you know, the one thing I've really enjoyed about, about, watching what you're growing at Cora is I love the simple message that you preach that that you are I love your credo about tough people win and the more I've heard you share and the more I've heard you how it applies to the program to the school to the community the more I realize that it really is a great credo on how to win at the game of life so so I just wanted to thank you for choosing to share a message and doing it the right way. So thank you for that coach. Again, much appreciated. Um, you know, our school has embraced it. It's become part of the culture and, um, yeah, we're, we're really proud of, of how, uh, everyone ad adopted it and is applying it now. Yeah, definitely. Okay, coach. So one of the first things I like to do in the huddle is, you know, one of the things I always remind people is, Hey, life is a game and games are supposed to be fun. So I'm curious, what is a interesting fact, some may say a quirk about you that maybe a lot of people don't know that you would feel comfortable sharing with our community? A fun fact or a quote, well, you're really putting me on the spot here. <laughs> um, you know what? I mean, I get really a, what you see is what you get person. Yeah. I mean, okay. my, my, uh, you know, my family's always first, but outside of that I'm football and I love working out. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of strength training. Mm -hmm. Um, but like a funny quirk, geez, I, I, I'm trying to think here. Some people think this is funny. I have two daughters. I'm turning into a dance dad. So I spent a lot of time at the dance studio <laughs> lately. Okay. Uh, that's a little interesting and unique. Yeah. Um, my wife is a dance teacher though, and a French teacher. Okay. So I've been brought into that world. And, um, while very different from football, there are surprisingly a lot of similarities too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just like we are passionate about our craft and our game. Uh, mm -hmm. my wife is about, um, dance and I'm seeing a lot of the lessons I teach in football also being taught in dance. So I, I didn't, you know, I, I gained a new appreciation for it. I'll say, uh, recently. No, and I, and I love that coach. And, you know, my daughter's been involved with gymnastics. So again, like you, I've gained appreciation for things I haven't been exposed to in the past. But what I really heard from you is that's, you know, a hallmark of all great leaders such as yourself is they're just open to new ideas, new experiences, because, 
you develop appreciation for the world. So I think that's a great reminder. Yeah, I find as I'm aging here, you know, almost all my reading and research was football centered. But uh, the more I'm in this game, the more I'm branching out into other areas and, you know, learning from other leaders in different fields, corporate area. And, um, you know, some of the best info and things I've got have come from non-football sources, but then mm -hmm. we apply them to football in our program. Oh, I, I, I love that. And again, speaks volumes to you also as an educator, right? The ability to take concepts and, and, you know, make them work for any situation. So I'm curious, you had a very successful career as an athlete, right? Uh, one of the things that I noticed was there was a lot of great feedback from Laurier football alum that's, that saw when we were going to have our conversation today. And again, lots of praise about, you know, who you are um, as a man and, and really, you know, just what a great leader you are. And then you've been in this process in your professional career transitioning to coaching where, you know, you've built, you know, a, a great program um, at Cora. Uh, one of the things that I, I listened to on a podcast of you, I think it was on Educate podcast was really, you built it from the ground up, right? You went down to junior level and worked your way up. So I'm curious, what role has sport played for you in your life and what would you say has probably been the biggest takeaway that you've really learned in the process? Well, I'll start by saying I appreciate my former teammates at Laurier for the kind words. I'd hardly describe my career as, uh, as an athlete as being elite. Um, there were kind of high points and low points. It's pretty injury riddled. But mm -hmm. I will say uh, it was an incredible learning process. And, and I think my time at Wolford Laurier really sh shaped a lot of who I am today and my values. So, you know, I'm forever grateful for that experience, the teammates and especially the coaches I had there. Um, but if you want to take this journey back, I mean, athletics have always been a part of my life um, from my mother's family and my father's family, both huge sports families, uh, more so basketball, I'd say on my mother's side, uh, which I played in high school. I mean, the sports we played, my, my father played tennis at Wolford Laurier, surprisingly, he was an excellent tennis player. So we grew up playing tennis in our summers. And then it was basketball. Uh, once we got high school football, hockey all the way through. And we always, I always did track the throwing events, not the running. And uh, yeah, I know that's surprising for people here. Um, but, you know, it was such a huge part of my life growing up and uh, it was fun, great friendships. I always say this to our players about football. Football is about life lessons, memories, and friendships. And um, those are invaluable. And those three things that I gained, uh, I think football, especially, but all the sports in my life have really uh, shaped who I am. And if I had to say one biggest takeaway from athletics, <clears throat> and as I age, I appreciate this more, is the relationships aspect. Um, and I, I have an even greater appreciation for that. I mean, you have great friends growing up in sports, and there's still people who stood at my wedding, um, you know, friends I know I can call at any time if I need something. Um, but I have almost a greater appreciation as a coach for those relationships now. Um, because they're so special. And, and, you know, when you have players now who have graduated and you see them being great leaders in the community, starting their own families, being fathers, husbands, mm -hmm. um, that's my favorite part of coaching. I know it's kind of cliche because you hear a lot of coaches say that, but the older I get, the more special it becomes to see a former player being successful in life. And, you know, it's interesting, like what I'm really hearing from you is, you know, I, I, I think it's very similar. It seems to be a theme that when we first, when we're younger and we're coaching, you know, it, it seems like the motivation is the wins and the losses, right? Or more the wins. But then as we get, as, as we become more mature, we start to understand that really it, it, it's a game of people, right? It, it's really the development of people helping students and athletes, you know, set them up to be that OUA, that old OUA tagline, which is being a champion for life. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. was there a moment where, you know, you really remember where all of a sudden you, you understood that it was more about, you know, de developing champions for life. Uh, and, and then by doing that, you actually then create the environment to where you actually do win more in, in terms of, you know, the scoreboard. But that's a that's exactly right. It's almost like when you shift the focus off winning and people, it, the wins just start coming. Right? It, it sounds uh, strange, but 
you know, I'll, I'll reflect a bit here too. When you said I was a younger coach and, you know, sometimes I, I almost feel, uh, I, I was putting everything I had into the programs when I was a young coach, but I just wasn't doing it right. My, my energy was not focused in the right areas. And sometimes I look back at some of my first teams and I, I wish I could have done a better job of relationship building and, and maybe teaching them more about life uh, with a little bit less emphasis on football. But I also understand that's part of the journey, right? I mean, um, if I didn't make those mistakes, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and I think that's an important process of going through that and working through that yourself as a coach. Um, the sooner you can learn that as a coach, I think the more valuable it is for you. Um, I don't think I was exactly quick to pick up on it, but I, I, I did eventually and I doubled down and it's been one of the smartest coaching moves uh, I've ever made and for our program as well. If I had to pinpoint a time where that's really, and I don't want to people to think like we just neglected relationships or people, yeah. but uh, I spoke at a clinic um, uh, in, the, in the winter, I think it was the Ontario High School Coaches Clinic, and uh, we did a, a presentation on building culture in our program. And I referenced uh, our 2015 team, which was a good team and had good athletes and great kids, but um, there were opportunities to step up and lead that season. And, and I expected these kids to lead, but they didn't know how to lead. And I don't blame those kids at all. And I really want, cause they're awesome kids and I still have a great relationship with them. I blame myself um, and our coaching staff for not giving them the tools uh, that they need to lead. So uh, after 2015, you know, I came up with uh, just kind of a simple equation. We say people first, then process, then results. So the number one priority in our program is people, um, you know, taking care of them, um, giving the tools they need, support them, love them, appreciate them. Okay, that's priority one, no matter what, then it's process. That's things like working hard, your schematics, um, you know, um, behaviors, habits, Okay. And then finally is results. And we don't even really talk about results uh, winning. Okay. We talk about developing the habits it takes to win, but we never actually talk about winning because you could do absolutely everything right. And then you play the greatest team of all time. And, and that's no one's fault, but knowing we put everything in, we, we, um, you know, did everything we can to become champions. That's the priority. And that's our focus. So, um, if you want background that 2015 team, I mean, I, again, it was, it was great kids, but I, we lost to a team that we had beat twice in the regular season in the playoffs. And um, that was one of the times, like a kind of a low for us as coaches, because we felt responsible. We thought our team that lost the playoffs was better than the team that beat us. Um, so after that, you know, a, a whole series of things happened. And, and I had some great mentorship from uh, some of my coaches on my staff there. Um, a guy who coached me in high school came on our staff, Bill Paul, and another guy named Paul Kalbeck, who is the vice principal at our school. This is coach football for, for years and it's a bit of a, a well-known football named Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, they talked about the importance of exit interviews. He said, you should talk to every single player in your program one-on-one -on -one and get their feedback about the program. What are the things uh, that they like about this um, sorry, what are the things that they think need to change? You know, what are their concerns? What can make our program better? And then we applied that feedback and um, it gave them ownership. And once that happened, you know, then it was just like a snowball effect. It just started to get, you could see the culture changing um, almost day by day. And it's continued to grow and grow and grow. And, you know, I was super excited prior to COVID where we were at. It was unbelievable. The energy and, and the enthusiasm and the positivity in our school, especially around our program. We took a bit of a hit, but I think it was so strong. We were able to kind of maintain it throughout COVID virtually a bit. It's obviously not the same. And I understand every program in the country is probably in the same boat. But uh, that's also why I'm really excited to get back now and, uh, you know, get back to where we were and even beyond. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, and I love that you're so honest about, again, that, you know, whatever you want to call it, that sort of like that moment, that awakening. Is, and what I really heard from you was a couple of things. One, there was this moment that all great leaders do is, is finding the opportunity to get better, right? And, and that's one thing I've learned, you know, in my career coaching is that sometimes the losses are the best opportunities to learn because you realize that, Hey, I, I got to get better from this. Right. And, and what I heard from you was again, taking that responsibility on yourself and just figure out, okay, let's create solutions moving forward. And, yeah. and it, it's such a powerful experience. And, and what I wanted to grab from you was I heard you reference 
before Tim Kite's work and yes. talking about shifting that focus from being outside in to inside out. So I'm curious, was, was that around the same time where you started to focus on that messaging too, that again, we're going to focus on the inside, the outside's going to take care of itself. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, leaders are readers and I, I'm traditionally not a reader. I, I And I still wouldn't say I'm, I'm M, but I force myself to do it. But what I have found is that I love audiobooks. I mean, sitting with a book, I find harder, but, um, and I started just, you know, digesting audiobook and audiobook and, um, it, that really helped me. That was right around that time too. And mm -hmm. I, I think one of the first ones I, I got was uh, the winner's manual by coach Tressel. And um, you know, a, a lot of great lessons in there, but so many things you said there, I, I want to address too. Like you said how I was able to, um, you know, say that I was struggling with something. And this ties back to our credo of tough people win. I, I believe most people think showing vulnerability is a sign of weakness, but uh, in our program, I truly believe this, that when you show vulnerability, it's a sign of toughness. Um, it shows you have the ability to do that. You're not putting ego in the way. That's really hard for teenage boys to understand too. So we, we try and do a lot of work to break that down. Um, that again, that message that showing vulnerability is a sign of toughness. And when our players can do that to each other, you know, and we, we do unity periods where they're talking about, uh, you know, we'll give them a, an important deep question and they'll be with a teammate and they'll share that and it'll be confidential. But when they learn about their teammates and their purpose and they show vulnerability to each other, then there's no stopping them. You know, they're going to be playing for each other. And uh, that's really the strongest thing. You know, you've heard about soldiers. They don't fight because uh, they hate the enemy across for them. It's because love for the person beside them or the people behind them at home. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. You, you don't want to let your teammates down more than anything. Um, so that's an important step and it's an important message. And again, I, I know that tough people win when people on the outside hear that. That's not something they attribute to toughness, but that's something we talk about. Um, and uh, yeah, so, I, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a challenge too with that credo where people think it's almost like a arrogant statement. But again, anyone in our building knows that has nothing to do with that statement. So that's one of my concerns with that. Um, the other thing you said is, uh, you know, looking within and I like, I think the saying is when, when problems arise or adversity, you can look out the window or look in the mirror. And it's another message we try and send to our athletes, you know, um, what can I do instead of looking to blame other people at that window, look in the mirror and you, you reference the messaging there of, uh, Tim Kite and, um, you know, that, that message they deliver their their kind of credo i guess is e plus r equals o right um event plus your response equals the outcome and that that's a, a common message we teach to our players right you do not control the events or the outcomes but you always control your response so no matter what the situation choose your r um wisely okay and, and there's a process to doing that and, and, and tools we can give our athletes to make better choices with their response to various events and, and that's really hard for teenagers too and, and I see it and I get it I made some terrible decisions as a teenager yeah. um, but we try and give them tools you know to take pause hit pause really reflect and, and think because you can get put in some very vulnerable and dangerous situations as a teenager that can completely alter your life so um, and, I, and I'd hate to see anything bad happen to one of our kids because of one poor snap decision um, in adolescence so yeah it's, it's another theme and, and you see, there's a lot of things I'm, uh, that I'm yeah. coming to mind here, but I think you're getting the idea that this is the priority. It's not wins. It's not even, I mean, yeah. those things are important for football, but th this is the stuff that makes the difference. Um, not just for our players to give them a better football experience, but even as coaches now, because this strengthens our relationship. When they graduate high school, they appreciate us more because it's not like they think about, we taught them how to run buck sweep. We gave them tools and taught them how to be mentally tough and, and develop skills to help them be better leaders, fathers, husbands, uh, et cetera. And, and I love that you bring that up because that was an idea. Actually, I was thinking about our conversation as I was out for my run today. And I love it because yeah, like your idea of toughness is not just physical. And, and yeah, it's easy to look at that, right? People would think, oh, 
here's another football coach talk about tough, but any t- anyone that's ever heard you speak knows that, no, this is about, you know, that, that mental toughness. And I love how you talked about that equation. I'm a firm believer that it's easy to react. It takes toughness of mind. It takes discipline of mind to be able to stop, to think, and to intentionally respond. So, yeah, I so I that. love that, that. And that takes, right. That takes mental discipline. So I, so I, I'm in complete alignment with you there, coach. And I love that, that you're preaching that message. Yeah. I like the way you worded it better than me, to be honest, that, <laughs> that was excellent. Um, yeah. T- toughness, like I said, could be showing vulnerability, but other ways we define it, it could be walking away from an altercation. Mm-hmm. And when we get kids come into our program in grade nine and, and, you know, they kind of tell us what they think toughness is. It's, you know, the guy who can lift the most weight or beat up the, you know, the toughest guy in a fight. And, you know, I get it. Physical toughness on the football field is an important thing, but uh, again, like you said, that ability to walk away from an altercation and, and be bigger than your ego especially as a teenage boy with testosterone pumping through you and peer pressure. I mean, we really teach our kids that that is toughness. Mm -hmm. It could be having a difficult conversation as well. Um, So many people just shy away from those or avoid them. And in my experience, that just compounds problems in your life. Um, But we want to attack those head on. Uh, Reminds me of a, a, I don't know if any other coaches out there have read that book, The Twin Thieves that just came out, Um, but I'd highly recommend it but there's a story in there about in the the plains of Colorado, you have cows and buffaloes both living there. And when a storm comes over the plains, the cows run away from the storm. And by running away from the storm, it actually prolongs the amount of time they're in the storm because now they're running with it. Whereas the buffalo, when they see a storm, they go head on and they attack it. So they're actually shortening their time in the storm. So, I mean, that's a message we're going to relate to our athletes, you know, be the buffalo. When there's a challenge, don't run away from it, attack it. And and Mm -hmm. really that will shorten your pain and, and produce better outcomes. Well, and again, I, I think you bring up, again, a valuable life principle that will allow anyone to succeed, not only on the football field, but in the game of life, right? And, you know, I even think back to this idea of you're a ball carrier and you have a defender in your way. The only way to the end zone is to run through the ball carrier, right? You can stop your feet. You're going to get hit. You're going to get smacked. It's going to it's gonna be a lot more painful than just, again, pump it right lowering the shoulder getting those driving those knees and just you know and great and analogy that, right great analogy so, yeah so many of these on the football field applied to life and there's just one example yeah absolutely so one of the things that sort of uh you know speaking along that that toughness theme that tough people win is i love seeing you highlighting what the athletes that what the athletes are doing in the off season. Like it's pretty impressive when you see just again, that mental discipline for the athletes to be lifting and, and not doing like, you know, what, you know, I mean, we both taught for a long time and coach that the easy thing to do is go in there do the bicep curl, do the show muscles <laughs> yeah. where when I, when I watch again, the athletes in at Cora, they're doing, the squats, they're doing the bench, they're doing the deadlifts, they're doing, they're doing the the big five. So yes. how have you, with that, how has it been, like, has that always been a big emphasis at CORE or is that something that's transitioned um, over the last few years? Uh, good question. Now, again, I, I love strength training. I've always, yeah. um, it's a passion of mine. And I think that's one of my ways to put my stamp on the program, but I mean, everyone knows the great programs are strong. And and I think, especially at the high school level is where you can have the biggest impact uh, on these kids. So when I first started at Cora, we we didn't even really have a weight room. So, or what, not much of a weight room. So a big part of it starting was building it. Uh, We're fortunate, we applied for a grant and got a huge grant to build it. Um, But we're constantly finding sources and, and, Once we built it a bit and kids started buying in, then our administration started understanding this is an important place. Like after school, like this is where kids that had nowhere to go come and they're physically transforming their bodies, which again, in turn is transforming their self-confidence and then applying to all areas of their life. Um, As much as I love football, and admittedly most of our lifters are football players, but we had plenty of lifters that are not athletes at all. And they've come back to me after and and talked about, you know, how getting in that weight room and just seeing progress has completely changed my self-confidence. 
you know, and, and apply it to other parts of my life, you know, that growth mindset where I can change my body or I can put in work and get results. So, you know, I, I think football is maybe one and weight rooms, maybe one B one, a one B. I think they're both great tools. I mean, every coach can, can, you know, influence people and improve their lives and their distinct respective sports. I think those two are very unique though. And I'm fortunate that they both kind of meld in our program. Um, but yeah, we, we've, like you said, we focus on the core lifts. Um, I think uh, you go on Instagram and social media now, and there's a lot of people almost feel like doing exercises for show. And it's easy for a young kid to get caught up in that trap or see a pro athlete doing something fancy, but, and that's fine and good for top athletes, but the majority of the demographic we're working with, they just need to get stronger. So we focus on squats, deadlifts, push press, bench and rows, and that's the foundation. And we'll mix in some of the other stuff for fun, right? Because kids, mm. kids like it, but uh, it's kind of drilled into our kids or ingrained in their DNA almost that these are the lifts that give you the most bang for your buck. Like 80% of your results, especially as a teenager, are going to come from doing this. Uh, and they bought into it and <clears throat> the results we've gotten speak for themselves. I think that's helped too, right? Kids, you know, put their trust in us and, and they see the people who've come before them. And some of the weights these kids are lifting now is, is, is mind blowing. The ones who buy in right from grade nine and consistently come, they're all getting phenomenal results. And, and again, that permeates through the school. People see that the best motivator in the world, I think for a high school kid in the weight room is seeing progress too. That's one of the reasons why I like to hype that up as well. Kids don't like to, uh, some anyway, don't like to post themselves lifting because they kind of get like, we get it, your strong comments or show yeah. off. But when I post it, it's, it's uh, you know, out of their control, but they, they yeah. do secretly. I know they, they appreciate it because then they'll get a teacher say, come to school, like, hey, I saw you on the Instagram. That's an incredible PR deadlift. And then they're feeling a little better. And then, you know, maybe a, a girl in the hallway who they been trying to catch her eye makes a comment or they see their t-shirt getting a little tighter on their arms. Once they see that, we got them, they're hooked. Um, so the big thing though, is the culture is getting kids to buy in and come, uh, a challenge we've had always. And I know every high school deals with this too, is they'll say, okay, coach, why work out at this gym in, in town instead? I don't need to come to yours. And that was something we really had to be, um, intentional about that, that we want you here with your teammates. I'm not saying you can still go to your trainer, but we need you here when we're training because it's about yeah. being with your teammates. And, you know, it doesn't take them long to realize that competitive atmosphere and, and positive atmosphere is going to get them better results being with all their teammates and the energy and the juice. And we got the music pumping. I mean, it's just so hard to replicate that when you're training in a, a gym with, you know, just people in the community and it's kind of quieter. So uh, we have something special going on in our weight room and it's a huge part of our culture and it's a massive reason for our success. Mm -hmm. And I love that, right? And, and a couple of reasons why I love it is one, you know, especially for males, again, you've been in education for a while that males physically need an outlet. And I think yes. working out gives them something that empowers them, that really teaches them how to live inside out. Because you really do. It's, it's really a simple cause and effect. You, you're going to get the results, but what you put in, right? So the effort that you put in will come out in the results. So, so I love that. It's, it's a great teaching tool. And I love how you talked about building that culture. I know my last year at Lucas, you know, I was really trying to figure out ways, okay, how do I empower, right? How do I, how do I get more buy-in? And I remember going to our veteran leaders, okay, this is the expectation. This is how many days the athletes need to be in here. And I, and I said to them, what percentage of athletes would you have to be in here? And, and we said, okay, they're playing high school hockey. Okay, they, that's here. But how many people would be in here? And they chose like, 85%. And I think that off season, we didn't have workout attendance under 90% oh, wow. for those two days a week because, and the funny thing is I did less. I just literally went in there, hung out, chatted with the boys and, and literally they policed themselves. And there was this accountability and this, this energy with the music and lifting. And so it was, it, it's great that you talk about how it's such a great culture builder getting in them in the weight room together, working towards a common purpose. Yeah. And, and I love that you said, uh, you know, you got to put in time under the bar there. It takes time to, to get results. And, and that's an important message that you can apply with football. Your team can't be ready to go week one. You gradually got to work to be a championship level team. Um, but it almost resonates better in the weight room that 
because they see the changes happening in their body and mm -hmm. it takes time. It's not people think you go in a couple of times, you're going to be bench pressing 300. That's not how it works. It's about steady and consistent habits and effort um, over the long haul. And all great things in life take time, right? And, and I, I know I've heard other people and some of your guests talk about this, the instant microwave society. You want something, you get it now on your phone. But, um, you know, that's one of the things that strength training teaches you. You have to put in time and effort for great things like transforming your body. If, if it was quick and easy to be jacked, everyone would be walking around looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? But that's yeah. not the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, relationships take time. Trust takes time. The things that are truly valuable in your life take time. And kids sometimes take that for granted now because they are shocked that these things aren't coming instantly. So we can teach them that, invest, take time, develop elite habits and consistency through football in the weight room, which really makes um, them appreciate the best things in life. Oh, I, and I love it. I love that you, you know, talk about one of those universal principles. Great things take time. It's the law of gestation, right? So yes. it's, it's, it's a great reminder and a simple message. So I'm curious, coach, you know, we're coming out of an interesting time here. And you built some momentum, right? You know, consecutive off the bulls and then, you know, um, the world, you know, hits pause. So I'm curious, as we transition back to getting back on the field, playing meaningful football, what is the big emphasis for you as a coach? Like, how, how do you prepare the players, you know, the coaches for really a, there's no playbook for this, for like, we've never experienced something like this before. Right. Yeah. Good point. And, and it is new territory. So I'm not going to pretend to have all the right answers. Yeah. I'm sure I have some ideas going in, but uh, I'll, I will learn a lot along the way. Um, from a physical and injury standpoint, I think it's important to ease into it. <clears throat> we can't just go all gas right away. Um, I talked to a few coaches in Alberta that uh, ran spring ball and they were they did dial it back and they st said still the like the amount of non contact injuries just from running and cutting uh, were up quite a bit. So um, I, I hope all coaches, uh, understand that and, and, and ease in maybe a little bit longer, um, than you normally would. Uh, but the important thing is in terms of culture, um, you know, you lose the carryover because every year, you know, if we, especially if we have success, you have players returning and now they're teaching the younger guys. This is what it took. We saw from the people older than us, the level of commitment, sacrifice, and what true leadership looks like. And now we can apply that to the younger people. Well, now with this gap, there's not as much. We're very fortunate um, to have a few fifth years coming back and who are going to be great leaders. So I think that's really going to ease the transition for us. Um, I, I, but I, I think another message is, you know, these just because we have been successful in the past, you know, people aren't just going to keel over and, and, you know, we're playing Cora, you know, if anything, we're going to get their best shot. So you have to fight that complacency or almost sense of, you know, we haven't lost a game locally in, in years now, but um, you know, eventually that's going to happen. Okay. But our players need to understand that our superstars in the past are gone. Okay. And they need to, this is a new team. Now, yes, we're going to try and instill a lot of those values and beliefs and that culture we had before, but we're only going to go as far as our leaders take us. So, and the more leaders we have, the better. So I think that's, that's kind of the messaging is, you know, it, it took a lot of hard work and effort to get where we were, and it's going to take a lot of hard work to get back there. And, and I, you bring up a great point. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that the best coaches are also the best teachers, right? And I think coming out of this time, you're going to really see who can teach the game and who can really prepare athletes because, you know, it, it, this, this mindset of, oh, just work harder, try harder, right? Of just, like you said, foot to the gas pedal. We've seen the evidence in the professional, with professional athletes. We've seen, you know, even in the CFL, when they got up and running that, if, if we're not intentional with how we, the environment in which we sort of put our athletes in, there's going to be some, you know, there could be some catastrophic consequences, injuries, right? So, so I, I love that you're talking about, like, it's really about, you know, going back to fundamentals and sort of building from the ground up again. Yeah. And that's the thing. I know some coaches may think, 
you know, we only have so much prepared for our first game and, and want to step on that gas, like we said a little sooner, but um, it, it is an investment, I think, to take your time because you could set yourself back by doing too much too early. So mm -hmm. uh, something to really be cautious of. And I'm, and I know most coaches across the, uh, the province are aware of that. Yeah. So one question that I, I had for you was, again, how I became familiar with, with you and what really resonated with me was when you spoke at the 2013 coaching clinic in Burlington. And just hearing you talking about the safe tackling really opened my eyes, coach. And it was, again, I had two young kids at, I had two young kids at home and I felt like I really grew as a coach then because I started to realize like, okay, I have kids. Like, you know, this is important because if my kids are going to play, how would I want someone to teach the game to my own kids? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious for you, again, I have you as being an expert with the safe tackling. How should we, as a football community, be approaching reintroducing tackling, you know, as we transition out of this interesting time? Yeah, I, I think a lot of the same rules apply. I mean, I just had this conversation with, with some other local coaches um, yes, this year is different because there's been a significant layoff in football, but almost every year the high school season ends and a lot of kids go 10 months without playing. So, I mean, I think it should be approached almost the same way, assuming that you are always teaching it in a progression from the ground up. And that's, 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 so the messaging is the same. It's, it's, you don't jump into contact day one, you start on air, then on bags and then with people and the whole safe contact progression is laid out pretty clear there. And, and most coaches should be trained in that now. And there's so many more resources now um, um, showing you the right way to do it. Right. Essentially keeping the head out of contact. So um, again, just an emphasis, it's always important, you know, mm -hmm. but you can almost even say now more than ever, but it's always important to use those progressions at the start of every season. We do it with, with our high school, obviously for those reasons. And another thing, if you coach high school, you're getting kids that come out for your team every year that have never played football. So, you know, there's, you're starting from absolute scratch there. And every year that should happen from the ground up, teaching them the basics. We do that with our, our, club teams as well. I mean, it starts from there. So yeah, just, just critical to use the progressions, start on air, then get to bags and then people, and then well, slow, slow on people, then gradually up the tempo to the point before you're actually full out live. And when you do go full out live, be smart with it. I mean, you're in close quarters um, or you're providing space, but you know, long distance tackling, when you see drills that almost you'll never see in a game that's just very poor coaching and a lack of knowledge of the game because those situations really don't arise in games and, and I'll be the first to say coach thank you for making me aware many years ago because you know as we made that an emphasis in our high school program with the junior Mustangs I know our athletes were actually much more successful tackling because your ability to communicate no this is how you break it down to the finite right this is even how you transition from speed to power revolutionize how our athletes and just built this level of calm and confidence in them. And, you know, we saw the results. So, so thank you for being a pioneer really in that field. Well, much appreciated. I mean, um, I, I had my playing career ended at Laurier from, from a neck injury and, mm -hmm. you know, um, to, to no one's fault, it was just kind of a freak thing and I'm fine from it, but that was kind of the motivation I had or why I became so passionate about, um, researching in depth how I can coach this skill the best and significantly reduce the risk of injury any players I coached and that's what eventually led to that clinic presentation you saw which eventually led into creating the safe contact program with uh, football Canada okay. okay so I'm curious you know one interesting conversation which <clears throat> I feel has been you know so many people are talking about and is around this idea of mental health and athletes, right? And again, depending when people are watching or listening to this, you know, coming out of the Olympics, it's, you know, it was, it was a hot topic. Yeah. And speaking at the OUA mega clinic, it's been interesting, some of the feedback I've gotten, because, you know, like we talked about, I think our definition of what we say is tough goes beyond that physical aspect. And I've really been... I've really developed this sense of appreciation because there's been a lot of coaches that said it was great to hear this message about 
it's really about developing calm and confident leaders, right? Like truly mentally tough. So I'm curious for you, you know, you come from a great program. How has this conversation around mental health and athletes, like, have you noticed a shift in, you know, what athletes need and, and how you're addressing, you know, kind of, let's just say this different world we're living in? Yeah, I think just the messaging um, and the stigma of it is, is really being destroyed. Um, you know, I, I think what we're communicating to our players about showing that vulnerability and asking for help when you need it is also coming from everywhere now. And maybe 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. And so many more people bottled it up and, and didn't get the help they needed. So um, I think that's a positive thing. I think what we do with, you know, kids realize, okay, maybe it is important to communicate this or show vulnerability or ask for help. I think our role is to provide those people that they can come to for help um, in the program and that they can trust to, to do their best uh, to help them. I don't pretend to be an, an expert in mental health. Um, I know who the experts are and I, well, within our school community and I can definitely get the kids that need help the help. But again, I think for most coaches and teams, it's just, really building trust with those kids in that relationship where they feel that they can come to you if they need help. And I think that's so important. So uh, we really try and uh, make that known to our players and it takes, you know, it's not day one that that's going to happen, but all of these activities and skills and lessons we teach are, are part of that process of them strengthening that relationship and building trust to the point where they feel that they can count on us and we do care about them. And I love that simple reminder, coach, because it, it seems to be a theme, especially this summer, again, speaking with, you know, great high school coaches, community coaches, OUA coaches, U sport coaches. And again, the best coaches understand that it all starts with building trust within the program, right? Trust between coaches, trust between athletes, trust with support, parents. And I, I just love that it's, it's such a common theme that it's an important reminder that it starts with trust. Yeah, I mean, that's the foundation of, of any relationship. And it, it takes, it's one of those things where we said it takes time and you have to put in effort and sacrifice to build trust, but it's also something that can disappear instantly. And, and I think that's an important message to kids as well. Like once you have someone's trust, like it's, it's still fragile, you, you can lose trust in an instant. So it, it's a constant effort, you're constantly working on it. So I have one last question for you, coach. So depending on when people are watching or listening to this, um, as we said, it's been an interesting time, but challenges, obstacles, adversity are part of the game of life. It's not that we want to expect them, but we understand it's part of the game. So I'm curious from you, what is a piece of advice, maybe a suggestion you would give someone that's maybe going through a tough time right now? that, you know, what is one action that they can take today to help them get back on their feet, to start creating some positive momentum and get back onto their journey to greatness? Well, I, great question. And I think that, um, you know, toughness and growth is the product of struggle. So um, I might butcher this quote too, but I believe it's something on the lines of God gives the greatest warriors the toughest challenges. So um, it, it's important messaging, I think, to get out to our kids. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll do a, another one of these. When I injured my neck, that was a tough time for me. I mean, it was week four of our, our season, my senior year at Laurier. And I'm uh, in the hospital. They took me to London on a spinal board neck. And I'm on that, in that unit. Um, I was one of the lucky ones. But there's people in there beside me find out they're never going to walk again. And, and it was a life-changing experience. And I wasn't even, there's was a lot of uncertainty about myself as well. At that point, I hadn't talked to the surgeon and I, and I was scared. Um, and, you know, some of the advice my, my mother gave me is when one uh, door closes, another opens. So, you know, while I may not be able to play football anymore, um, there are still many of opportunities to be successful in life. Um, so that's something I'll always remember. Um, in terms of what something people can do, I am a huge believer personally in um, 
your health and your fitness is a catalyst for all great things in your life. And I think people are happiest when they see themselves growing and improving. So uh, for me, and, and you know, everyone may be different, but when I'm feeling off or down, I think I like to prioritize my health exercise. Once I start doing that, I feel better. And then it's just momentum. And, and like I said, it's a catalyst for all great things in my life. So I, I would advise people to do what they can to get healthy, even if that's getting more sleep, um, eating healthier and exercising if possible. Take care of yourself there um, so that you have the energy, the focus, the clarity to improve other areas of your life. And I love the simplicity of that, right? Coach, it's just our body, right? And I often look back when you were talking about, you know, fueling your body, getting outside for movement, you know, getting outdoors. It's that think great, have a great thought, right? And I think choosing to move your body starts, you know, thinking great. When you think great, as you talked about, you feel great. When you yes. feel great, you act great. When you act great, you play great. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's football, whether it's health, relationships, finances, career, when you start with a great thought, it just, everything gets a little bit easier and feels a little more effortless. So thank you for that simple reminder. My pleasure. Yeah. So coach, how can people get connected? How can they follow Core Football? Well, it, we're pretty active on Instagram. Um, we do have a Twitter account, not very active on there. I just went on there the other day and saw some DMs that I, I missed. Um, I was late responding to, but uh, we're at Cora Football on Instagram. That's probably okay. the best place to reach us now. Okay. Um, so yeah, please, if you want, if I can help in any way with anything, uh, please send us a DM. It will be me on the other end uh, responding. So you can take comfort in that. So you know who's the face is at the other end. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I love that. And, and like I said, hey, I'll speak from experience. Coach is great at getting back and, and is always, again, servant-based leader, always looking to help and, and serve others. So um, yeah, reach out. I, I know Coach will be more than happy to help. So Coach, I just want to take a moment just to acknowledge you. I want to take a moment just to acknowledge you for the man you are, the, the great husband, the great dad, the great coach and mentor, but most importantly, the great human being you are. The one thing which I've really observed from you, even from a distance, but even more so from this conversation is how you choose to flex your perception muscle, how you choose to reframe, how you choose to find the opportunity. And that is a testament. That's a quality. That's a characteristic of every great leader is that ability to, to find the opportunity, find the greatness. So thank you for reminding me of that simple, but powerful message. I really appreciate that, especially coming from you, JT. I mean, I know you're someone who's very passionate about uh, inspiring people and developing leaders as well. So hearing that coming from another like-minded individual means so much. So much appreciated. Yeah, no worries. So here is my challenge to you. And as Coach and I have been talking about, tough people win, right? And we're talking about toughness and all, physical, mental, emotional, socially, right? Tough people win. So here's what I, here's my challenge to you. Coach dropped so many valuable nuggets of wisdom. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is to take one of those. And as I often remind you on the huddle, knowledge is potential power. It's the focused and consistent application of that knowledge that actually creates great results. So apply it, go do the work so you can reach your next level of greatness. Have an amazing rest of your day, and I will see you next time in the huddle. Have a great day, everyone.